All right, everyone, I'm still walking through the Museum of Flight here at Boeing Field, and they're about to close. It's about five minutes until closure. So I'm kind of just running through, looking at things real quick, but Hal gave me about an hour and a half tour. I'll probably make a few videos here, but I hope you guys enjoyed this. mail plane and it flew the west coast up and down carrying the mail of course that's what Lindbergh had done out of St. Louis to Chicago and these were all mail planes in the day and that's how you made money with airplanes uh, this was an air, this was a mail plane too uh, but Lindbergh went to um, San Diego the Ryan airplane company mm -hmm. and said I'm gonna go for, on this uh, trip uh, can you make something a little bit bigger for me uh, we'll do it and and that's how they got the spirit of St. Louis and in, in January to um, January to May, that's when they built it. And in May, he took the trip. And, and you've seen the Spirit of St. Louis yes. probably in Smithsonian. What a lot of people don't realize is that everybody went crazy after he came back from Paris and got into airplanes and, and created an interest in flying and the like. Well, there was a young cartoonist uh, that came up with a little uh, mouse and and he called his little first movie playing crazy and, he, and it was mortimer the mouse and his wife said that's a terrible name let's rename him mickey and so his first real movie was steamboat willie but really it was uh, charles Lindbergh creating the interest that created Ma mickey mouse wow so i don't know if you knew that i did not boyne had built a couple of model 40s that had seats inside to take uh, mechanics to the side of a breakdown because he was on contract air mail 18 which was from chicago to san francisco and this had 28 stops boom 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 i mean 28 hours 10 stops and jane enid was his first passenger she was a newspaper reporter in chicago and she flew that first one and all total he flew 585 passengers they had a two seat model and a four seat model and and that got him interested in in, in uh, commercial aviation passenger planes so what started the museum of flight here was the model 80 right over there and that's the one and only ex existence of his first passenger plane in night this is 1927 this is 1930 and they found it in a garbage dump up in Anchorage, Alaska. It, the side was cut out to haul boilers up to the northern slopes. Um, and this lady became famous. Her name's Ellen Church. She was a student pilot and wanted to be a pilot for Boeing. In those days, Boeing had purchased Pratt & Whitney, Hamilton Propeller, his airplane company, and he bought five little airlines and combined them, called them United Airlines, which is United today. <laughs> and she wanted to fly for that. And he said, no, but she says, well, I'm a registered nurse. Why don't I fly uh, in the cabin for the safety and comfort of your passengers? And she became the first stewardess. She helped hire seven other ladies, and they became the first ones to do that. What was interesting on that plane, this could hold 18 people, passengers. Um, it flew that same route, San Francisco to Chicago and back. Uh, they would make her do everything. They'd make her help push the airplane in the hangar at night along the way, tighten the bolts on the chairs when they came loose, obviously take care of airsick passengers, but they never made her handle the passenger luggage. You know why? There was no luggage compartment. How did you get your... Planes could only make money if they carried the mail and uh, with passengers, not just passengers alone. So how did you get your bags to your destination? Train. Train. Ahead of, ahead of things. 
So basically, she did that for about a year and a half. Um, she was the one that came up with the rules that, that used to be that women had to be single, only so tall, so weigh so much. It wasn't some guy, it was her, Ellen Church. She became an army nurse, captain in the army in World War II, and then later ran a uh, hospital in the Midwest. But uh, they, a bunch of Boeing employees restored this in Auburn, Washington, just south of here, and so that's why it's called City of Auburn. But this is what started the Museum of Flight in 1965. The Blackbird, obviously, you know about. Uh, this is a very unusual one. It's not an SR-71, it's an MD-21. It's only one of two, because it has a drone on it. Uh, they tried to, after they signed the SALT II Treaty, they promised not to overfly Russia with manned aircraft. They were going to do it with the drone instead, but it never really worked. In fact, on the mothership, the drone uh, on the third attempt ran into the tail of the mothership and crashed it, causing one of the crew members to die when he drowned when, after bailout. And they never really, the drone, they, they sort of use it off the B-52s, but it, it wasn't terribly successful, so uh, they didn't use it. But the Blackbird itself, uh, we're about 180 miles from Portland, Oregon. If you were to get in your car and, and, and right now and drive, and it would take off from Beale Air Force Base, uh, it would refuel over Montana, fly down to uh, New Mexico, the Mexican border, over to L.A., and come up to Seattle and go back down to Sacramento area, Beale, and do that in two hours and 20 minutes, and you wouldn't be in Portland, Oregon yet. Um, its last mission was uh, L.A. to Dallas. It did it in 68 minutes. Um, the, the funniest mission I've heard it flown is... Uh, uh, we have a guy named Brian Schill that comes up here in the summertime and he used to drive these things. And he said uh, President Reagan wanted, in, in the early 80s, wanted to overfly a certain site in, in North Korea. And he said he didn't understand the mission. He's supposed to do figure eights at speed and not take any pictures. And he said, well, why? He says, I want Amer them to know America's up there and he can't do anything about it because every seven minutes there'd be a double sonic boom. And they'd be flying at, at 85,000 feet or above. and and uh, now missiles could shoot it down. No, none ever did. Over 4,500 missiles were shot at it. Uh, none ever hit it because of the, you know, by the time they see it coming and get and, and uh, react, it's gone. So you're flying at 2,200 miles an hour, roughly. Um, one of the things that's really funny, I had a Russian visitor here one day and, and I said, uh, let me show you the airplane you helped us build. And he says, what? I said, yeah, they needed titanium to build it and only country in the in the world that had titanium deposits of quantity was Russia. So we had to buy uh, Russian metal for, through other countries and then turn around and build, you know, use to build airplanes. So 90% of that plane is, is made of Russian metal and we use it to spy on them. So it's still the fastest uh, air breathing jet ever made, but it was so expensive. And uh, Jack Fry called him from TWA and said, I'd like to buy some for my airline. He said, sure, right after you build a 60 for my airline, United. He didn't like that, so he went to a young aeronautical engineer, Donald Douglas, and said, build me something to compete with the 247, and he built the DC-2, which you'll see across the street. And it was a better airplane. It carried, it carried four more people. The 247 carried 10, and this carried 14. And it was just as fast, and it didn't have a center spar through the cabin like his did. And so this became very popular. Then C.R. Bell from American Airlines came to a boy, uh, Douglas, and said, build it a little bit bigger. I want to have 14 people sleeping on it like a Pullman. So they built the DC-3. And when they took the, the Pullman beds out and put seats in it, it had 21 seats. And that was the first airplane that could carry just passengers and not the mail and make money. So we all know the story in history. They're still flying today. We had one when I was in the Air Force at our base. Uh, they fly in Alaska. They fly in the Caribbean, you know. All that's still a great airplane, even though they're 70 plus years old, 80 years, uh, about 1935. So the difference in manufacturing, five years between this and that, look at the difference. It's yeah. amazing to me. And then uh, the small plane category. Curtis Robin. Yeah, and it's a newsboy because it would drop uh, newspapers all over Nebraska, flying over, uh, you know, 300 newspapers a day or something. But the funny story is about uh, Douglas Fer uh, Corrigan. Have you heard that one? Mm-mm. Douglas Corgan was a me mechanic in the Ryan factory that built the, the uh, Spirit of St. Louis in 1927, and he wanted to duplicate what Lindbergh had done. And so he bought a used, uh, in 1937, he bought a used Curtis Robin, they were, they were about 10 years old, 
and he uh, modified it, put a big gas tank in it, and flew from Long Beach, California to New Jersey and landed. And then in those days, you had to get permission of the government to cross the ocean because they had to come get you if you failed. So they came out the next day to look at his airplane and it was, he, they thought it was a wreck. The magnetic compass didn't work very well. The engine was didn't seem reliable. The gas tank leaked, so they said no. And so he filed a flight plan the next day to go back to Long Beach, California, and 28 hours later, he landed in Ireland, and he became Wrong Way Corrigan. Uh. <laughs> uh, and and he, what he really wanted was Lindbergh's acknowledgement that he'd flown over across the ocean. He didn't fly to Paris, but he flew across the ocean, and Lindbergh would never give it to him. He said, well, you said you didn't do it. And, and, and you know, the FAA or at the time, the CAA, didn't believe him, and so they... Uh, took away his pilot's license for three weeks and he just got set in Irish bars and got drunk and then uh, came back to a ticker tape rate almost as large as Lindbergh's. That's just a beautiful airplane. We, yeah. The curator got it. When we got this, he got that. He says, I just had to buy it. it they only built about 11 of them. They were, they were training bases, planes for the Honduran Air Force. This is an exact uh, copy of uh, Amelia yeah. Earhart's plane that flew around the world that didn't make it. So it's painted in her numbers and the whole bit. Now, this actually, this particular one, there's only three in the world, this actually made that flight in 1997, Linda Fitch flew it. So here's a, here's a, um, here's a, a here's a uh, test. That's a piece of Amelia Earhart's plane that's never been found. So how can we have it if it's never been found? So when she started her trip, she started in Honolulu, Hawaii, and she was going to go westbound. And she went, when, as she was taking off, she ground looped it and crashed and caused considerable damage. Well, there was an army private that was that was uh, assigned to guard her airplane, and so before it was shipped back to Burbank to be rebuilt, and and he clipped a piece of metal off of the landing gear area, uh, just as a souvenir. And they did all the metal, metallurgy and they did everything and they found out in truth that is off of her plane. So uh, it's pretty cool. So this is where, you know. <clears throat> she was going to go this way and then crash on takeoff. So they boated, shipped it back to Burbank. It got rebuilt. She flew it up to Oakland and the yellow line is hers. And then she went to New Guinea, landed and then took off for Howlin Island and never found it. And so a couple things happened. They had a big uh, trailing aerial on it that was removed when they were on the, on the ground so they wouldn't drag it. And then uh, put on before you take off. They forgot to put it on. So her radio reception was terrible. It had no aerial. And then uh, the Coast Guard was there and they were, she didn't understand. She wasn't very technical. She didn't understand that she held the microphone down they could give her a DF steer but she didn't hold it down long enough. She'd just push it quickly and all that and they wouldn't have time to get it. They started saying her Morse code. She didn't understand Morse code. She or Fred Noonan, neither one. And he was sitting in the back. He was back here. And there was a huge gas tank between them so they actually couldn't physically get together. They had to pass notes with each other on a clothesline. Uh, but you can... <laughs> There's a lot of debate how good of a pilot she was. She was in 11 major crashes. Um, but she did, she was the first person to fly from Hawaii to the mainland of the United States. She flew all these records here, went to Mexico City, did all of that. And of course, the famous one is the one that uh, she never made it back from. Hey guys, I've been here at the Museum of Flight for a couple hours and a, a young gentleman, Hal Breyer, a uh, volunteer here for 12 years, uh, walked me through about two or three different galleries. I hope you guys enjoyed it and, and how I have a YouTube channel about only 7,000 people, but you know, I guarantee at least a few people might watch this video. So. Well, I hope so. Thanks for coming today, Dewey, and I hope everyone else comes and enjoys our, our place here in Seattle, Washington. But uh, I really appreciate the hospitality. You guys come out here, uh, the museum right here on Boeing Field. I fly into Boeing Field all the time. Uh, just come here. It's a beautiful entrance with a Super Connie sitting out front. You can't beat it. And you see people like Hal. So thanks, Hal. Thank you, Dewey. All right. And guys, we'll see you guys later. Until then, blue skies.